Hello, everyone. I'm very excited to present our research topic to you today, and it's entitled Resilience of Deaf Students in Post-Secondary Education. This study has been going on now for past three years. It was founded by a Creativity Innovation Fund, and now that we have finished our Innovation Fund work, I would like to share the results with you of our study. Before I present our study, I'd like to recognize those who were involved in helping with this research project, our colleagues and assistants. This was sponsored by the Deaf Studies Lab, run by Dr. Peter Hauser. Peter Hauser has always said that there's a constant question that nags him, and it res relates to resiliency in deaf people. He wondered how deaf people make it through the system of oppression and come out on top as a successful deaf individual. Those questions led me to think about the characteristics character of deaf students and how it helps, what helps them get through their life in a successful manner. I think this is something that we see quite often and that we all understand at this point. The term is autism, which generally relates to deaf people is bad, deaf is bad, and it was presented by Dr. Tom, Tom Humphreys in 1977. This was from the University of San Diego in California, and he coined the term autism. That idea, or the notion of this, is that people look at us from a medical point of view and think because we can't hear, then that limits the rest of our lives, and therefore oppression causes us to fight barriers against this our whole lives to become successful and to be seen as positive human beings. Deaf and hard of hearing people face this every day in their life. Perhaps they don't recognize it. Sometimes they do notice the struggles that they fight every day because of the challenges of the notion of autism. So this is a question I'd like to talk about, the effects of autism on psychological resilience. Let's talk for a minute about the word resilience itself. What does it mean? So I open this up to you. You who is in the audience, what do you think resilient me resilience means? What does it mean to you? Go ahead <coughs> and shout out your answers and I will copy sign. Competition or sports? Sports, competition, okay. The ability to recover being stubborn, as we call it, or having determination. Resilience, meaning that it's resistant to negative impacts. Uh, the word that we use for this is often suffer, or put up with, or deal with. So what else? Anything else about the idea of resilience? Continuing, despite negativity. Resilience, meaning oppression, other ideas, success, being successful. As you can see, our concept of the word resilience varies from person to person in the audience. I would like to take a neutral stance on how to sign this, because it can mean many different things. And there's a million signs that could cover the concept of resilience, but I'm just going to use a simple sign that we all know in the room is an initialized R that's shaken. Now, there's different signs. Some people use this at World Federation for the Deaf. We saw that this summer. Through our lives, we know that there are different challenges, obstacles, and frustrations that we, that we experience. Disagreements, family issues, disputes with, with um, excuse me, disputes with friends. Some of these things can be very detrimental, and they happen to us throughout our lifetime as we grow up. Resilience is similar to a shield that one would wear on them during these times of disagreement or difficulty. That shield would either protect us from these difficulties or the shield would be too weak and they would pierce our shield and affect us. So resilience gives us a positive idea, positive strengths. And if even though these negative things are happening, as you can see here on the side, stress and conflicts, all those bad experiences can penetrate our shield if we're not careful. Difficulties with school, difficulties at work, people being upset or heartbroken over various situations in their life. Often when people are faced with that, they have a choice, and that choice is to give up or to get through it. We see often within the deaf community, deaf people or students, they just give up. They feel as though the system is too much and that they've internalized the mentality of autism, autism, and therefore they stop trying. Now other deaf people, on the other hand, do not have this reaction to the same events, and I'm wondering what characteristics make them react in a different way.
If your shield is thin and weak, then those negativities can penetrate it and affect your person. Mm -hmm. If it's strong, you can see over here on the slide, that you can fight off these difficulties. People who have a strong resilience means that they can get through these difficulties. It does not mean, however, that they don't have negative experiences within their life. They experience the same things everyone does, but they have a knack to be able to get up, get back on the horse, and try it again. Other people aren't able to rebound from some of these difficulties. Sometimes people have mental health issues, have anxiety, have low self-esteem, or have depression and can't cope with life's difficulties. Resilience study, that the resilience study we did, looked at two different groups. One was protective factors that we studied, and the other was the group of risk factors. Protective factors were things like, does this person have family support? Do they ha eat healthy? Do they have an academic advisor to guide them through their school experience? Do they have positive relationships? Do they have good energy around them? Risk factors can be, do they experience poverty? Do they have two or three jobs they're trying to struggle with to put food on the table for their children? So those are some of the ri risks that were studied in the risk factor group. When people see stressful situations, those that were resilient see them as a positive place to take them out of their comfort zone. They might have anxiety about it, but they're willing to take that risk and can put a positive spin on it. Often these people have commitment. It doesn't matter what comes in their way. They finish what they do and they have a commitment to their ideals. People who are resilient oftentimes realize they cannot control everything and they accept the fact that life sometimes has unexpected things that come into your way that you have to deal with. They realize they can't control it all and don't, don't worry about that aspect of life. Support from others is very important. If they're having emotional difficulties, they ask for ideas and feedback from people to help them continue in their path. Another thing these people exhibit is close, secure attachments to other people, good relationships. These people have strong personalities. They have personal and collective goals that they reach. And the other thing is self-efficacy. They know that they have confidence in themselves and can succeed. Often people who have success in the past can keep that. For example, if you have a first breakup, and you're torn up and you don't know how to handle that relationship, the second time you break up, you've learned and you've taken strength from the effect of the first stress. So by the third time you have a breakup, you've learned how to navigate these waters easily. So you learn how to face family members. For example, a death of a family member that might be devastating to you is something that you learn how to handle and you build resilience through, a f through time. Also, people have faith. They have faith that they can do it and they develop their resilience through the idea of the face that they have. In this study, we have a framework that we used. And again, we had the protective factors and the risk factors. And I'm going to continue on that path and explain the rest of it at this point. So, here's a big question for us. Is being deaf in and of itself a risk factor? We have a no. We have a no, 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 several no's. Seems like we all think no. Then what is the risk? Then what risk do we face or do we see? Alcohol, drugs, depression, yes, that's true. Those are risk factors. But if you think about this in a systematic framework, and the system that we face on a daily basis? What barriers are put in place that causes us sometimes not to succeed? What is the design of that system that, that treats us in a way that is unequal to our hearing peers? If you think of a college-age student, not necessarily a child, but if you think of a college-age student, what have they internalized as from from life as a child and, and where does that put them now? Oftentimes people say they can't hear, you can't write well, they have these negative images, you can't get a job. And so those are some of the predictor skills of risk, people who have these risk factors.
Good afternoon, everyone. I'm excited to be here because, as Jason mentioned at the beginning of this presentation, this research was funded by an NTID innovation grant a few years ago, and we are thrilled to share the results that we found thus far. Now, our research needed to start somewhere, and no research is perfect. So we as a team discussed where we wanted to start, and we chose four specific tests that we wanted to use within our research for the deaf and hard of hearing college students that are here on campus. The size of our sample was approximately 40 students. Uh, they were a mix of deaf and hard of hearing. Some students knew ASL, other students didn't know sign language. I'm going to talk about each of the tests that we used, and I'll share the results with you as well. Do you mind being my person at the PowerPoint, Jason? The first test that we, uh, we administered was the Connor Davidson Resilience Scale. This was created by uh, two faculty members at the University of North Carolina. They were studying people who were experiencing depression, and they wanted to see how those individuals' resilience improved throughout their lives, what their coping skills were, how they coped with life challenges and situations that they faced. Both Connor and Davidson created a test called the Resilience Scale. Our team contacted those two individuals and asked if we had their permission to adapt their test for our needs, and they approved that. And so we administered this to the deaf and hard of hearing students who were in our study. The second test is called the Implicit Association Test. I'll refer to it as IAT for the rest of the presentation. The IAT was designed at Harvard University. And it was designed many years ago to measure individuals' biases that have been internalized. It's true that everyone has a bias, and some people show their biases explicitly, others don't, but all individuals do have biases. So for example, maybe a person is biased uh, as it relates to women, or um, there's racism and sexism and other prejudices. This measure was designed to identify the biases individuals had. Individuals filled out a survey, and uh, the survey asked the individual's point of view. Now, if you fill out a survey, can you honestly, truly, 100%, without doubt, answer a survey asking about your opinions and values with integrity? Probably not. So the implicit association test was designed as a way to show the internal biases, measuring how quickly the person who takes the test responded to the test items. The individual took it through a computer. The more bias you have, the longer it takes you to respond. A team of three researchers created the formula that was used uh, within this measure to measure the time, and the results are really based on milliseconds. Not even seconds, but milliseconds. So it could just be, you know, the difference between a breath of air, how the test is measured. This test, again, was developed for all the different prejudices that are around in mainstream society, racism, sexism, genderism, etc. We contacted Harvard and asked if we could adapt it for the deaf point of view. Comparing the deaf and hearing perspective, we were approved, and so this is the second measure we used. We call it the Deaf Implicit Association Test. 
at the end of the test when you take it, the results are shown to the person who takes it immediately and you'll see where you would fit on the scale. Hopefully this test will be available to all the NTID community in the future, not, not to share it with others, but to take it individually to see where you are on the continuum to reveal the biases that you may not realize you have. So we're going to show you what the DIAT, the Death Implicit Association Test, looks like. We'll give you a, a taste of it. On this test, there are over 200 pictures. They're drawn by hand. Uh, they were drawn by an NTID person. Do you remember who that was? Oh, it was a hearing student. Uh, that person drew all the pictures for us to show the concept of good versus bad. So they're grouped in groups of four. So say, for example, a mother bathing her child, two people hugging, a girl holding the flower, the pinwheel, and then on the bay or the lake and the sun rising or setting. Then the picture of the four bad pictures are a snake biting someone, someone having a gun pointed at them, someone being very unnaturally thin, and then a car that's stuck in a flood. These pictures are shown to each individual. Now, first the pictures are shown prior to asking the person about their ism because they're figuring out the measures and they're figuring out the reaction time. So the pictures are given first. So we'll give you, an ex uh, give you a taste of what the test looks like. This is what the computer screen would look like. You see the word good on the far left and the word bad on the far right. And the individual needs to press one of the keys to indicate whether it's the good or the bad. So I'm gonna ask you in the room to please raise your left hand if it's good and your right hand if it's bad, okay? So we'll do that. Are you ready? We'll see, we'll show you a few examples. Which is it? Bad, bad, good, bad. <laughs> so you get the idea. These are just a few examples, but again, there are 200 pictures that the person taking this particular measure needs to go through. Everything is scored. Here are other pictures that the person taking the test sees. You see the four pictures of deaf people, and you can identify the deaf people because they have the blue frame around their face, and the picture of hearing people. Each hearing person has a yellow frame around their face. And it's the same concept as the good and bad. The person taking the test has to press a computer key to indicate whether the person is deaf or whether the person is hearing. And we're going to look at the colors. Deaf. Hearing. Now you go ahead and practice. We're going to give you the test a little quicker. So you can see how the blue frame and the yellow frame he helped you to make that association so you could quickly answer the items on the test. Now, how we adapted this test, um, and I'll talk about the what, how, what we did and then how we may use this in the future as well. For this particular study, as you can see, on the left side, we have deaf and the word good on the left, and on the right, hearing and the word bad. And so then again, as items were presented, the individual needed to press the correct button. And 
Now we're going to practice more at test speed. Okay, maybe you felt um, like you saw, hmm, I'm saying two things at the same time, which one do I do? If you think about deaf and good, you'll hit it faster. If you don't think about deaf being good, then you might have a little, neg say if you had a negative view of deaf people, it might be a slower response time. And then we test for the reverse. Now you see the labels have changed sides. So we have deaf and bad on the left and hearing and good on the right. Okay, test speed. Now this test, we use the color code for now. The next time in our next phase, we're, inc we're thinking about using deaf people who are signing versus a hearing person who is speaking rather than using the color coding to see if the results are similar, but that's a future instantiation of that test. For right now, you saw what the students saw who took the test. And in Harvard, and in Harvard, they use this for the different disabilities. They connect it with different disabilities. For example, people with different handicapping conditions that might have a negative feel towards that handicap condition. So this is why we're using the, we also see it done with black, white, various race issues, hearing, deaf, by color. So that's how they've um, ferreted it out at the Harvard study, and we followed the same model. I have the research with me about the IAT if you're interested in reading. Actually, I've got three articles on three of the measures that we used if you're interested in reading that. I don't have enough time to actually explain each of the measures in more detail, but I have those articles if you're interested. Uh, I already described our subjects. We had 40 students, a mix of deaf and hearing, signers and non-signers. Now, for the IAT test, we divided the groups, our subjects, into two major groups. Zero in the middle meant that there was no bias. Positive numbers meant that the individual had a positive view of deaf people, and negative numbers meant that the individual had a negative view of deaf people. So you can see how they saw uh, visually how the number line on the bottom and then the categories were determined. We came up uh, with another test score. We decided um, with our findings from this group that we would call the group who looked at deaf people as good as people at the resisted autism group and the people who looked at deaf people as bad as the internalized autism group. That's how we compared the two groups following this system. The Connor Davidson Resilience Scale, um, I'm going to show you the results now. You can see from our finding, the group of individuals who look at deaf as a good thing, the resisted autism group, seem to have better resilience. Uh, better coping skills, better abilities to recover after negative situations. Now remember, our sample size was small. It was 40, and in the future, we would like to have a larger sample size. But for our findings were those who internalized autism had reduced resiliency ability. That's something we found. People who internalize autism have a higher risk for not being able to cope with life stresses and uh, things that go wrong.
The next question we asked were, well, what are the protective factors if we see internalizing autism as a risk factor? So we were talked about which measures we could use to identify protective factors. We tried to predict what these protective factors would look like given the next test that we used. Yes, our, our hypothesis asked that is it a deaf person has a sense of belonging, as Jason, Jason explained earlier, people who are resilient have a feeling of community and connectedness with other people. They have a feeling of being engaged, being part of the community. So that was our next question. Do people uh, who are resilient, is being protective, is that part of being feeling as if they're part of the community? And what about their sign language skills? Do sign language skills play an important role in this as well? This next test is called the Deaf Acculturation Scale. It's quite prominent. It was developed by Maxwell and McCaw, McCoy, Maxwell McCaw and Z Gallaudet University. Uh, Zia was a PhD student at the time, at Washington student. Uh, these individuals collaborated. It was a huge study with over 2,000 deaf subjects who were researched. And from their research, they developed this measure. The measure is to identify how connected the individual is with the deaf community. This happened in 2008. So uh, we measured the student's level of acculturation, deaf acculturation. It's interesting. People who internally feel that deaf is good tend to have a higher acculturation score and a higher sense of belonging to community than those who do not look at deafness as a positive. And the findings really aren't surprising, but they've confirmed our hypothesis and what we thought. I see people in the audience saying that there's, these findings aren't surprising, and we would agree. So this shows that deaf acculturation is, we consider it as a protective factor. The next test that we did was called the American Sign Language Sentence Reproduction Test. And this was created by Peter Hauser, Raylene Poldinevsky, and Ted Cipolla, and Daphne Belvier. Belvier. Raylene is at Gallaudet University and she works in the psychology department. Of course, you know that Ted is at Georgetown University and the four of these research came together and, and came up with this test for American Sign Language Sentence Reproduction. Now we've had, had things in the past, but this is a different type of form than we have seen before. This measures the native ability of a person and their ASL skills or the signer. This was taken as a reproduction of a spoken language test and modified for sign language. So the test has a total of 20 different sentences. The more that the person watches and is able to sign the sentences identically to the model on the video, the more native like the person signing is and are their sign language and their sign language skills there are and their sign language skills, of course, are native. We start at a basic level and then continue on to a more difficult advanced level. So we can give you an example of some of these sentences and you can practice for yourself. So I'm gonna ask you to watch the model on the screen, the talent on the screen, watch them sign, and then you practice and follow along. That tree tall. Okay, so you copied it exactly the same way that she did it exactly. We filmed people doing this, and then we continued filming them till the very last sentence. So this is the last sentence, so we're jumping to the end of the test. You can see that that's a more complex sentence than the first one we started with. So that means the person's more native in their ability to copy what the model is showing. So this is the exam or the instrument that they used. 
to score people's sign language abilities. So are there any questions about this particular test before we continue? So Jason, with this test, it scored how we hired native signers, and we tr the Ted Zapala trained them to watch them, and the score was either one or zero. The sentence was either reproduced correctly or it was not in reproduced correctly. All right, again, we compared the two groups that we have been studying throughout our, our research and deaf students who, who saw themselves as good and positive also had a high score with their sign language skills as opposed to those who thought being deaf was bad and, and had internalized some autism. Their sign language skills were not as strong as the other group. So again, this confirmed our hypothesis. So I want to emphasize, and remember, this is a small study with only 40 students participating. I don't want you leaving the presentation today thinking that all deaf people, all deaf students who sign, all deaf students who are acculturated into the culture and community are resilient. That is not true. This is just a higher percent. We're not saying they all are. It's a higher percent. And students who don't sign does not mean that they all view themselves as negative or have an autism internalized view. I don't want you to misunderstand the findings. This is just a trend within the small study that we did. So I don't want you to think that it can be generalized to the whole population. Okay? So we're hoping to do a bigger study later with Peter Hauser and with Ron Kelly and hopefully we'll be able to re replicate our study and see other findings. As Kim said, Kim said, just because an individual might be an oral person and speak English does not mean they're not resilient. But we're talk we looked at people who are in the community of people. So if the person speaks and they're among a pe community of speakers, they might be more resilient. And so that's how we looked at our study. I just wanted to make that clarification. Exactly. Again, these are four different measures or four different instruments we used. And in summary? Oh, let me just summarize my last two slides. Internalizing autism is a risk factor. That's something we found in the protective factors are being connected with and engaged in a community where you feel like you belong and being able to sign. And you can interpret sign as actually being able to communicate and in order and also get the resources and support that you need when you're faced with life's ups and downs. So that's a summary of our study. tips for people who teach. Uh, if you're teaching deaf students here, you might want to encourage a community atmosphere, encourage the students to be involved and engaged in the community. And recognize that there are systemic barriers for people who are deaf and hard of hearing. Um, but there are tools that we can use, tools to navigate the system. <coughs> And they're designed for us to navigate. We can't, we can't change the institutions in which we live, but we can teach students how to navigate them and how to be effective in their navigation. One is to be a member of the community. One is to find a mentor or be exposed to role models who have navigated the system. People who have had success can instill the younger people with the information they need to succeed. Because younger people, people who haven't navigated the system may think that they can't. And when they find somebody who can, they have that learning experience. Tell your students to participate in clubs and organizations. At those clubs, they can share their frustrations with peers, and peers can often be role models for one another. And they, you can recognize that it's OK to deal with life every day. And then the students will realize it's OK to just get up tomorrow morning and face life as they find it. So we have to find our role models to share their journey, to be specific examples, to show that you can overcome life's everyday happenings. And then the younger students with whom we teach can succeed as well and become more resilient. This study had two parts. One is the quantitative measures. The other part of this study was a qualitative 
portion. And there were 10 different deaf professionals that we interviewed, asking them their perspective of resilience and how they continued and persisted in their work and in their lives and in their home environments. We tried to understand why is it that some deaf people were able to overcome some of these negative factors and others were not. So we looked at some of the characteristics in a, native, in a narrative form. If you look at the literature about the black community or about the gender issues that we see, they are out there, but there is no information out there for the deaf community yet. So we're hoping to start that now with this study and continue it. So we went to a research seminar last spring that you may remember held here at school. and. And we went to the SVP Summer Vestibule Program and presented this to them, to the students at SVP. We shared this. And we shared the stories of the deaf adults that we took from our study. And we came up with some strategies to share with the students in SVP on how to become resilient and navigate through these difficulties in life. So this has been a fun experience. Thank you so much for coming this Thank afternoon. You. Thank you for your attention today.